This is a dream inside a dream. To enjoy Inception is to buy into an idea. The idea that inside each of us lies dreams, and inside those dreams exists a version of us that dares to dream as well. In Inception, I think that Christopher Nolan is asking us to believe in those dreams, our dreams, to, as he has the character say, take a leap of faith. Sure, it's Nolan at his most outlandish. It's an idea film through and through, but in my opinion, it's one of the films where Nolan is at his least misanthropic. He isn't hiding his message. It's there for all to see. Dream. Dreams are good. Dreams are therapeutic. Dreams are also scary, but dream anyway. On that same surface, 2014's Interstellar seems like a movie with very little in common with Inception. In Interstellar, Nolan doesn't want you to believe in dreams, he wants you to, at least on the surface, believe in love. His characters talk about love as a world-saving trans-dimensional force that makes us human. And yet I think Interstellar has more to say, something more interesting. And you can see that not in a dream of a dream, but in Nolan's movie inside a movie. The conceit is simple. After wading through all the physics, Cooper has left his 10-year-old daughter and teenage son to find a new planet for humanity as Earth's oxygen supply begins to dwindle, and Nolan establishes a simple narrative tool here. As they begin their descent onto the first possible planet, in search of the astronauts sent there and the data he had collected. Time. Nolan makes the enemy of this sequence very clear. It's time, and only time at least for now. Go, 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 go. Seven years per hour here. Let's make it count. Every hour spent on this planet will cost them seven years of time relative to Earth, thanks to a shift in relativity. We know they have to get off this planet as quickly as humanly possible, or that little girl crying on her bed may never see her dad again. Or better yet, there will be no one left on Earth to save. And so begin the inception of Interstellar, the movie inside a movie. They land, and the timer starts. And every moment they're on this planet feels like an hour for us because it does for them. And for a few of those moments, things seem okay. And then it happens. Those are mountains. This sequence in particular nearly splits the film's runtime right in half, and it marks a clear shift in scope. We as human beings think we know what space looks like, generally speaking. So does Cooper and Brandt. They, as do we, have an idea of what we might see out there, should we ever make it out of Earth's atmosphere. And this wave, literally and figuratively, brings all of that crashing down. No one's always been a fan of VFX, of pushing what's possible or widening its scope. But between his ambition, Hoyt Van Hoytema's cinematography, and the VFX work on the film, what he creates here is awe-inspiring. Through a single shot here, Nolan establishes three things. One, scale. Through smart framing, we get just enough of an idea of how big that wave really is. Two, through that scale, we in the same shot get a very clear sense of the danger our characters are in. And three, Nolan establishes precedents, precedents that will drive the rest of the narrative. This shot is a wake-up call to both the characters and the audience. It isn't just time that we should be afraid of, it's the mission itself. It's these worlds. A new enemy has been established, but no great story is complete without its conflict. And we're here. Brant wants to complete the mission at all cost, a characterization we understand. Cooper knows that she's not just risking time, she's risking their lives and those of his families. As the wave looms above them, she goes for the data. But it's around this moment you might notice something. From the moment we arrived here, Hans Zimmer, the film's composer, has been doing something borderline subliminal. He's using the score, sound, to etch the stakes into our mind. Just listen. What do you hear? A clock ticking? A metronome running? That ticking noise ticks about every 1.25 seconds. Every tick, every 1.25 seconds, is a whole day passing on Earth. Through Zimmer's score, we can literally count, hear, the days passing by, the time wasted. And now we're reaching a crescendo. That ticking clock has turned into an orchestra of suspense. Brandt is trapped under the data itself, and it's all going to drown 
this moment. Tar saves Brant, Doyle washes away, and so too does the ship as it comes crashing over the wave. Waterlogged. Stuck. For an hour. And then, silence. In the middle of this set piece of this story, everything just stops. And we learn just how bad it is. What's this gonna cost us, Brant? A lot. Decades. And we sit here with them until it starts again. The clock, the wave, the stakes, the years, it's all here. Nolan releases, for a moment, us on this ship stranded for a reason, so that this can sink in, so that we can breathe. Breathe before the water literally swells again. But brutally and masterfully, those breaths are short because we're still here. And to humanize the moment, he even goes as far as to shift the aspect ratio from a grander screen encompassing ratio to a more cinematic ratio once in the shuttle. Nolan isn't about a 16 minute fireworks show. It's why this moment is so effective. He wants you to take it in, to fear it while you're in it. And to do that, you have to be given the time. So that when that moment to breathe ends, there you are. That wave comes, the roar, the stakes, and then... Engines up! This is Nolan's story in a story at its conclusion. The end of the tale. Cooper gets back on the ship only to be told 23 years have passed. And he sits in silence as he watches the life he should have lived pass by him. Until the videos end as his son and daughter let him go. To Cooper, it's been hours and yet he's already been left behind. It is gut-wrenching. Nolan doesn't take the easy way out either. He doesn't just sit there and let the videos play. He spends almost 65% of the sequence with the camera steady on Cooper's face. As McConaughey does his best acting of the film, Nolan knows that the reaction is better than the action and so he keeps the camera where it matters. And what does this moment say? Well, that maybe parenting is a journey that flies by you devastatingly fast. That it's always better to be present, that that stop and smell the roses thing, yeah, that just might be good advice. Nolan's film in a film wants us to remember to appreciate what we have, to appreciate the moments we have with our children, to remember how ephemeral those moments really are. As Brandt explains in the middle of the sequence, we can't go back in time and fix, re-explore, re-experience, we can only go forward. And so in one sequence, Nolan has given us a setup, a twist, characterization, the conflict, the climax, the resolution, and wrapped it all in a tight thematic bow in just 15 or so minutes. A movie inside a movie. One of the easiest criticisms levied at Christopher Nolan's films is that they are nothing more than their ideas, that they're the filmic equivalent of a concept car. And yet, while his peers rapidly embrace this new digital age, while they cut cost with green screens, Nolan is still the kid with a camera. The guy spending his money on figuring out how to use a centrifuge to build a working, rotating hallway. He's still the guy shooting the space movie about black holes on film stock. Interstellar is a somewhat flawed masterpiece stuffed in a modern blockbuster. And that's not because we need to buy into an idea as heady as Dreams Inside of Dreams, instead, in just 15 minutes, Nolan creates a tight, suspenseful, self-contained short film in a grander, much larger one. I think his movie inside a movie is a testament to how strongly he believes and wants us to believe in something. And I don't think that thing is love, I think it's film. Interstellar is an ode to movie magic, and an elevation of what's expected from its biggest names. Today, it's easy to be jaded, fatigued by blockbuster cinematic universe culture, and yet, Interstellar, Christopher Nolan, all those years later, gives us a reason to keep believing there's something left in big ideas.
that's it for today's episode of Nostalgic. I want to thank you guys for all the love after my last vid. Sad that video had to be made at all, unfortunately, but so happy to have gotten the support you guys have given since then. If you don't know, a lot has happened to this channel. My last vid explains it all, but a Patreon now exists, and you can check that video and the Patreon out in the links in the description down below. If you enjoyed this video, press that like button down below. If you haven't yet done so, also hit subscribe. That way you won't miss anything I put out. Finally, a huge thank you to Surfshark VPN, who are sponsoring today's video. You can get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deal slash nerdstalgic. And if you enter promo code nerdstalgic, you'll get 85% off three extra months for free. Surfshark VPN is what it sounds like. It's a VPN. It'll help you secure your digital life. Plus, you're getting great prices, especially using this deal. Surfshark is one of the best VPNs out there. They are totally unlimited. You can use it on as many devices as you want. It's got 24-7 live customer support, 30-day money-back guarantee, and importantly, they employ strictly no logs. That means that nobody will know what you're doing online. Not even the company, which is a huge deal and a way that they're different from a lot of the other VPNs on the market. If you want to protect yourself while browsing and show a little love to the channel for free, again, you can get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deal/nostalgic in the description below. And if you enter promo code nostalgic, you'll get 85% off and three extra months for free.